Now we're going to try to finish the rest of the insects that have incomplete life cycles. This ought to go, I hope, fairly quickly. Uh, and uh, because we don't have all that many orders to go through here. Now, again, what we've gone through is, is uh, we've gone through the, uh, the, the uh, mandids, the cockroaches and termites. Now we're on the hemiptera. What I want to cover today also are two other orders that we've not talked about before. Those would be the thrips, the thysanoptera, and the socoptera, the bark lice, and book lice. Notice that I've got the, the thrips marked, and the reason for that is that thrips can be very important plant pests. They're probably one of the most important pests in greenhouses right now. And, and we're having real problems at, at places that are trying to grow commercial cannabis now. One of the big problems that they have are spider mites and thrips uh, on the, that cannabis. And, and so uh, they, they can be significant pests of various crops. Now, the first order that we're going to talk about is, are the hemiptera. And as I indicated to you before, the, uh, these used to be divided into two orders. The true bugs, those were the hemiptera. And then there were the bug-like insects, the homoptera. Well, again, the molecular genetic folks have, have said they're really not all that, that separated. Uh, they, they, they really need to be one order. And so uh, the, the oldest name for this group was the hemiptera. I actually prefer heteroptera. Uh, and you'll see that in some books, but heteroptera is this sort of heterogeneous t winged uh, and, and so forth. But um, uh, we're, we're going to stick with the ones that most of the taxonomists have, have divided on. If you take a look at this, there's actually three suborders of this. And by the way, you don't need to remember these technical names. Remember these scientific names. I don't expect you to, to remember the heteroptera. I can't even pronounce well the Achinarinka and the Sternarinka, uh, those have always been some of the hardest words for me to remember how to spell and even pronounce. And I have to look it up most of the time myself uh, when, it, when I see those. But those are the bug-like insects, uh, the ones that include the cicadas, the aphids, the hoppers, those that we saw in laboratory. And they used to be combined in one order, the homoptera. All of these have piercing-sucking mouth parts. And what we mean is that they've modified the mandibles, what we call the maxillae. We'll learn about that in greater detail when we talk about the morphology. And the back flap of the mouth parts, the labium. They've, they've elongated those out into these long, piercing, stylet-like structures. When those all kind of fit together, they make soda straws. And they make two straws, one to secrete saliva and the other one to suck up food. So they have these piercing, sucking mouth parts. Now when it comes to the true bugs, this sort of suborder heteroptera, those have not only that two pair of wings with the front wing half leathery and half membranous, but if you look at them, the sucking mouth parts look like they arise from the front of the head. That homopter group, the bug likes, the mouth parts are kind of, it's hard to see the mouth parts because the piercing sucking mouth parts appear to come from the back of the head. I think all of you, if I just showed you one of these and didn't tell you what it is, hopefully you could say, yeah, that's a bug. And, and what we refer to as that bug shape is that when that half leathery, half membranous wings are folded, what you'll see is that this, what we call the scutellum, this little plate in the thorax, we see a triangular shaped scutellum. And there, where the membrane of the wings overlap, you see sort of a diamond shape. So that triangle shape and diamond shape, where you see those wings, uh, it's very distinct. And it, even in this uh, four-line plant bug, here's that, that little triangle shape there, and then the diamond shape where the wings cover. Now, that doesn't always work. In, in the case of a lace bug, the lace bugs have developed this reticulation of the whole surface of the exoskeleton, and it's kind of hard to see what are wings and what's the rest of the body on, on that. So, uh, But in general, we see that half leathery, half membranous, the triangle, and the diamond shape. Many of these have stink glands. You know that. If you picked up a stink bug, you probably have regretted it. Uh, it 
Now, you know, you kind of get some strange things going on. I, I've, I've gotten to where I don't mind stink bug odor. It, uh, it, uh, it's almost a sickly sweet smell to it. Now, if you're in Asia, we'll learn this also uh, when we talk about eating insects. Uh, if you're in Asia, especially in Thailand, Indonesia, places like that, there are street vendors that have baskets of roasted stink bugs. People eat them. Yes. So I'm going to record that. So the, the, the question is, is, why do these stink bugs sort of accumulate? Somebody had said maybe it's their pee or something like that. Actually, the, no, they have what we call an aggregation pheromone. Both the males and the females produce this pheromone, and it basically says, I found a good place to hang out. Why don't you join me? <laughs> but it's not their pee. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's not an excrement. It's not... Um, uh, and we'll, we'll find out bugs don't pee. Uh, they're, they're actually like birds. They, they produce uh, 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 a uric acid component, which is a dry uh, white crystalline uh, type material. But they do have scent glands, and in this case, they also have pheromone glands that produce different odors. Now, the scent gland is for protection. It's, it's to repel other things. But that scent gland, if you actually smell that, it, it is a, a much sweeter odor. We have our, we've actually, for that brown marmorated stink bug, we've artificially synthesized that odor, and we have traps with that in there. I, I have a trap that I run at home. Every morning, I get about, uh, oh, anywhere from, from 10 to 20 stink bugs, and I take them into the laboratory because they're trying to rear them and, and study the parasites uh, that are in them. Good question. The vast majority of the true bugs are plant feeders. They feed on plant saps. They feed on, on seeds, just like what we saw with the milkweed bug and so forth. But there's a, a fair number. There's several families that are predators. Uh, the, the, uh, somebody brought in earlier this uh, wheel bug. Uh, a regiviad bug, or what is called an assassin bug, uh, and, and it's a big predator, and it will take on almost any insect that it finds, and basically what it does is it uses its beak to stab a hole into its prey, and it's kind of interesting. It actually injects saliva first, and this saliva has a neurotoxin in it. And, and so they, they sort of paralyze their prey. Once their prey has stopped wiggling, they go in. And now, instead of injecting another uh, a paralyzing agent, they inject digestive enzymes and liquefy the internal organs uh, of their prey so that they can suck that both all out. Uh, some of them, of course, are blood feeders. What's the blood feeder you're most familiar with? Bed bugs. But... I'm here to tell you there's another one on the front that, that we're worried about. You may have heard of it in the news. It's called the cone nose bug or kissing bug. Uh, this is one that, that generally was found in, in Central America and South America. It's moved up through Mexico. It's now fairly common in southern Texas. Uh, and this one's a really nasty one because it transmits Chagas disease. Chagas disease is a blood protozoal parasite that attacks your connective tissues. And it basically causes your cartilage and connective tissues to dissolve away. Pretty nasty organism. People that have a real bad infestation of that, their facial features begin to disappear. Ugh, pretty nasty thing. Again, all of these have that gradual metamorphosis. They're going to have eggs, nymph, adult stages. Now, I picked a leaf-footed bug. Uh, th this one is one that I pinned out. I spread its wings out, and I got my high-resolution camera and, and took a, a, what we call a, a stacked image of this so that I can get everything in focus from the top to the bottom of it. But here I wanted you to see that in the four wings here, we can see that the, the four wings... Even though they're all pigmented brown, you can still see that half leathery, this part right here, and then the half membranous part that's got the wing veins in it. Notice that the hind wing is all membranous. And so those hind wings fold back over the abdomen, and then the front wings fold and actually overlap each other uh, on top of the, the uh, hind wings. When I flip this over, 
Now you can see the mouth parts. And here you can see this big piercing stucking mouth part. But notice that it actually is attached to the front of the head. So when this thing feeds, it actually that, that comes out and can actually project forward or straight down uh, to feed. And so, uh, but when it's not in use, they just fold it down the, the mid ventral line and hold it there. Now the next two suborders, these are the ones that remember we used to call the homoptera. These are the ones that again they have piercing, su piercing sucking mouth parts, but now what we're going to find is that the beak or the piercing sucking mouth parts arise from the back of the head. <coughs> Another feature of these that's not listed here is that their wings, the front wings, are the same texture throughout. I know this gets a little complicated. That means that the, the front wing can be entirely leathery or it can be entirely membranous. But it's not half leathery and half membranous. Again, they do have the two pairs of wings. Now, what we also find is that there's a few of these that have some really highly modified life cycles. Uh, some of the aphids, uh, if you'll notice the, the aphid video that I showed you, you didn't see any individuals in there that had wings. And when we study aphids a little bit later on, we're going to find out aphids have probably one of the most complicated seasonal life cycles of any of the insects. They alternate between winged forms and non-winged forms. They alternate from entirely female societies that are parthenogenic, that means they reproduce without mating, to bisexual forms where there's males and females in the population. And they change all that stuff within an entire season. Wow. Pretty bizarre. So. Uh, what we, you know, some of these won't have wings, some will have wings. When they do have wings, the wings are usually sort of held kind of roof-like. They're not folded flat over the abdomen. They're held kind of roof-like over the body. You're familiar with most of these. Uh, oh, another feature of this, there are no predators or bloodsuckers in this group. These are all plant feeders. And more importantly, many of these feed out of the vascular bundles. So they're going to take a lot of water and sugar, and what are they going to do with that? They're going to excrete it as honeydew. Unfortunately, some of these, because of the way that they feed and they're very mobile, they may feed on a plant that has a virus. They can pick up those viral bodies in their body and in their salivary glands. Now, apparently, it doesn't infect their cells. They just carry it. But if they move to another plant and feed, if those viral bodies are in the salivary glands, when they spit in the next plant, they can infect the next plant. And, and so they can be some very important vectors of plant diseases. In this group, uh, some of the ones you probably recognize are the cicadas. Uh, they, these are some of the, the bigger of, of these uh, types. We saw some little uh, uh, tree hoppers in there. There's a whole bunch of these that, that are hoppers. In this one, you can see that the entire front wing is what we would call hyaline or cellophane-like, transparent. In the case of this little tree hopper, its front wing is entirely leathery in there, but the hind wing would, would be membranous. In this group, Another quite a bit of diversity, uh, we've got the aphids. Now notice the, there are winged aphids and non-winged aphids in here. Uh, generally, when an aphid starts a colony, all the first adults that develop won't have wings. But when they start getting crowded, they, they, they start bumping into each other and getting in each other's way, the nymphs that live in that environment develop wings. <laughs> Why would they develop wings? It's too crowded here. I want to fly somewhere else and start a new colony of aphids. Neat. So they often develop those wings by stimulation of how much contact they have with other aphids. Also in this group, there's a little group called white flies. And, and these are really bizarre. Uh, and I hate to say it, but when we get into the life cycles of those, we're going to find out that they don't seem to have that 
regular, you know, egg nymph adult. They're going to have a whole bunch of little intermediate stages that, that all change uh, in form. We have special names for those. Finally, the scale insect. Does that look like an insect to you? To me, it looks like some sort of a fungus or disease growing on the plant. But these are scale insects underneath each one of these waxy shells in here. This little round waxy shell is a female. That's a cactus scale. There's a female cactus scale, and when I flip it over, a blob, no antennae, no legs, a soda, -like, soda straw-like mouth part that sucked into, that's into the plant sucking plant juices out. That's it. The males, on the other hand, you'll notice that there's these little elongate ones right here. Those are actually will be male scales. And when they emerge, they have regular little antennae. They have a head that's distinct. Uh, they, they have legs. And they have, instead of two pair of wings, they've only got one pair of wings. Wow. That's enough for the hemiptera. Let's go now to the Thysanoptera. This one is... is Again, one of the, the groups that I really like, and, and I always like this because of the physics of what's going on. I'll try to explain that here in a minute. The Thysonoptera, Thyson means fringe or hair, terra wing. And what it's, it's referring to is that if I show you a thrips, I, I'll do this here in a minute, uh, that, that is uh, winged, what you'll see is that the wings are nothing more than two sticks that stick out. On those sticks are long fringes of hairs, and they can fly with that. Could you fly with two, with two sticks on each side with a bunch of hairs on it? No matter how fast you beat it, you can't fly. However, if you're really, really tiny, most of these thrips are in the, the millimeter or two range. A really big thrips would be four millimeters in length. When you're that small, you can use that two sticks with hairs on it to literally swim through the air molecules. They're not really flying. They're swimming through the air molecules. That's really bizarre. Now, we say that they have chewing mouth parts, but most people would say that it's, it's kind of a special modification. It almost looks like sucking mouth parts, but it's not quite. And, and so they've got the, uh, and it, they're asymmetrical. Only one mandible and, and one maxilla has been kind of elongated. And they use this to, to sort of jab and poke and, and scratch the surface of plant material. They rasp the surface of the plant material to extract the juices out of the cells out of those plants. Virtually all of these are plant feeders, though there are a couple of species that, that are predators, and, and there's a couple of species that also feed on, on fungi. <coughs> While we say they have a gradual metamorphosis, wow, look at that. And this drives me nuts. Thrips specialists have said, well, we think they really ought to be more closely related to those that have a complete life cycle. So what we're going to say is that when they hatch out, the first little instar that hatches out, which should be the first instar nymph, we're going to call that a larva. Okay, do what you want to do. To me, it's a nymph. It's the first instar nymph. Then what we're going to do is that larva is going to feed and pretty well complete all of its development. Then it's going to molt into a non-feeding stage. They call that the prepupa. I call it nymph number two. I just call it non-feeding nymph two. And then that's actually developing the wings. Then it molts one more time into a immobile non-feeding stage, which the thrip specialists call it a pupa. And then finally that molts into the adult. Here's, here's the problem. That prepupa and pupa usually drop off of the plant and do their stages in the soil. So if I'm trying to control thrips, can you see what the problem is? I spray it with an insecticide, what will I kill? Well, I'll like, kill the active nymph, that larva. I'll kill the adults, but I won't kill the prepupa and the pupa. 
So what that means is that I'm going to have to come back in a few days and retreat that plant. It's always, uh, this is one of the biggest hassles that we have with greenhouse operators. They say, you know, I applied that insecticide and, and a week later it's like nothing happened. Well, did you apply the insecticide a week later? No. Well, you missed the pre pupae and pupae that had emerged as adults. You needed to make at least two applications to knock them out. Oh, you cannot have a thrip. <laughs> there is no such thing as a thrip. You can have a thrips and you can have a dozen thrips. It's one of those weird words that's both singular and plural. So if you know another entomologist and really want to irritate them, say, oh, I found a thrip today. Here's some pictures of them. Uh, here's a, a fairly common one that I find under the bark of trees. This is actually the, the uh, black ones are the adults. The red-orange ones are the nymphs uh, that are in there. Okay, the larvae and the pupae, uh, the pre pupae and so forth in there. That one's kind of an interesting. It feeds on fungi. Uh, over here, uh, this one is the pear thrips. Uh, and we're having real problems with the pear thrips right now because pear thrips overwinter as adult thrips. They come out so early the pear trees haven't put any leaves out. So they go to sugar maple instead. And on sugar maple, they attack the leaves just as they're unfurling, and they cause the sugar maple leaves to get all gnarled and twisted up and so forth. And what's that going to do to the sugar maples? Reduce maple syrup production. So this one's a real problem right now. Uh, and it didn't used to be, but uh, we think with the changes in temperature that we're seeing, that's allowing for these things to overwinter better and there are bigger populations in the springtime. And the sugar bushers, the, the folks that, that make maple syrup, are really worried about some of these. Here's a close up. And what I wanted you to see, this, this is a western flower thrips. Uh, and I've really blown that up. This thrips itself is one millimeter in length. Okay, that, that's how big it is. You can see the wings have been folded over the, the body, and so you can see they look like nothing but a stick, and then here's the hairs sticking off, off of that. <coughs> Next group are the Socoptera. These are uh, general term or sausage, but I prefer book lice and bark lice. And notice how I spell those. What is that telling you? These are not true lice. <laughs> They're lice-like. They look to some people like a louse, but they're not true lice. They're not like a head louse or a pubic louse. Uh, those would be two different words. Now, in this one, uh, they, they have a really funny bulge off of the front of the, the head. We call it a bulging fronds. Uh, you don't need to, to remember that, but they have this weird bulge. Uh, they come, again, in winged and wingless forms. Now, the ones that we often call book lice are so dorsally ventrally flattened that they can fit between the pages of a book. Wow. What are they doing in there? They're feeding generally on molds and mildews. And so if you go over to the library, there, there are sections of the library that I can take you to that are kind of down in the dungeon and out of the way where if you go in, it smells a little musty uh, down in there. And we can open up some books and thumb through them. And all of a sudden, we'll see a little brown thing running around on one of the pages. Uh, that's a book class. What do you think a bark louse would be? Those are sausages that live on the barks of trees and shrubs and pri eat primarily the lichens and blue-green algae that grow on the bark. They have chewing mouth parts, and as I stated, they generally feed on, on molds, mildews, and the bark lice feed on lichens and blue-green algae that might be growing on that surface. Here's what they look like. They're all pretty small. Uh, though there are some, some bark lice that can be almost a half an inch long. That, those are really big. Uh, but the, the book lice, if you see those, two millimeters is about the, the, the size of that. Uh, this one's a really neat one. Uh, this is all, uh, when I lived back in Pennsylvania, we had an old Victorian home. And I remember studying one night. Uh, and it was, you know, the, my daughter had gone to bed, my wife had gone to bed. It was, was kind of quiet. And as I was studying, I heard this little. I go, what in the world is that? So I started looking around, and, and I, I, I just kind of 
where is that coming from? And I finally got over to one side of the wall, and I realized it was there was a little flap of wallpaper that had come loose. And I pulled it back up, and the Death Watch Sosid was on there. The Death Watch Sosid is called the Death Watch Sosid. Oh, anybody an Edgar Allan Poe fan? The Telltale Heart? The tap, tap, tapping in the middle of the night? He's referring to Death Watch Sosid. And, and you know the the person felt guilty. They had killed somebody, and they thought the the, the you know the ghost was returning and, and so forth. But it was actually the the tapping of the death watch so said, uh, that was doing that. All right, that's that's all you need to know about Sosids. Uh, we'll probably not even visit them again, even on the exam. Hint hint wink wink. All right. The last order that we're going to talk about are the Theraptor. These are the true lice. Now, again, just like with the, the Hemiptera and the Homoptera, there were actually two orders of these lice. There were what we call the biting lice and the sucking lice. Now, my major professor back at Penn State was a louse expert, and he always was saying, Dave, this can't be true because there's a louse, there's a couple of species of lice that seem like they both bite and suck. And they've got kind of intermediate mouth parts. And sure enough, when the molecular genetic people looked at them, they said, oh, they, they're, they're really all the same thing. The, the Malophaga and the Anaplura are lice. Uh, it's just that some of them retain more ancestral chewing mouth parts, and others have modified those chewing mouth parts to, to pierce the skin and suck blood. We'll talk about the Malophaga first. These are, are the, the sort of the chewing lice. The vast majority of these feed on birds, and, and in many cases, many books, they just call them the bird lice. But unfortunately, there's a couple of these that also get on mammals. The, the, there is a dog louse, which is one of these biting lice that gets on dogs. Now, we didn't used to have much trouble with them, but it's showing up even here in Columbus quite commonly. Where are the dogs getting these? That dog louse loves coyotes. And we're seeing a rise in coyote populations in, in many areas. And if your dog is socializing with a coyote that has dog lice, it's going to get dog lice. The mass majority of these are on birds. And if, if you're somebody that, that has pet birds, when you take it to the vet, they will periodically check them to make sure that they don't have lice. So they, they can be treated. Uh, but uh, if you see your bird constantly scratching and, and so forth, they may have lice on them. These lice are very flat, and by the way, all the lice are dorsally ventrally flattened and have secondarily lost the wings. There are no lice that have wings. Uh, lice can't fly from one person to another. Now, I've just got a picture here, of, or a, a diagram, and you can see here the, these uh, little chewing mandibles up here. And basically what these biting lice do is they usually come down to the end of a hair shaft or a, a feather shaft. They'll chew on the surface of the skin and take that up. Sometimes they'll break through the skin and there'll be a little pus that comes out of that, and they'll feed on that also as, as part of their foods. Here's the, uh, the goose louse, you know, uh, all those uh, brants that you see around here, what we call the Canadian geese, they're really Canadian brants. They've got a really big louse. That, that louse right there is, is a little bit over uh, an eighth of an inch in length. Uh, they're laying their eggs. You can see the, the eggs have been, uh, are elongate eggs and, and are glued to the uh, bases of the uh, feather shafts. The other Suborder of this are the Anaplora. These are so-called sucking lice. These are ones that have modified the mouth parts so that they can pierce the skin and take blood out of their host animal. Again, dorsally ventrally flattened, primarily wingless. These only suck blood from mammals. They're only going to be on, on mammal and ma or mammal parasites. The most common ones that we have, we've already shown you a video in the laboratory of the head louse. And there's a really nice picture of a head louse. Uh, I had somebody bring me some of these. Uh, <clears throat> it was actually one of our, our uh, 
staff members, a uh, little girl came home with a little note from the teacher that said, and she was all upset. She came in and said, can I come over and see your daughter? <laughs> no, I'm not weird and pervert, I, uh, but I do want to go through your daughter's hair and pick out some lice. Uh, and, and so I picked off the lice, and I had several live ones in a vial, and I took one out and, and put it on my hand, and it immediately, it had been so starved, it immediately started sucking blood uh, out of the skin of my hand. That's not where it would normally be. But you can actually see this dark trail in here is the blood that's going into its stomach. Uh, it's actually clear enough that you, you can see through that. <coughs> what did we call lice eggs? Nits. So these head lice will attach their eggs to your hair. We call those nits. Now there is a, a second louse that's not illustrated here. It's the, called the human body louse. Uh, they look identical. The difference is, is the body louse actually prefers to live in your clothing of the body, but they'll get onto the body, feed, then they'll go back into the clothing and they'll actually attach their eggs to the fibers of your clothing. And so sharing clothing and things like that is how you transmit them. The way that you transmit these, uh, What do two girlfriends do when they get together today? Pardon? At least my, my every time I see my, my granddaughters get together with their girlfriends, they go, oh, hi, how you doing? Let's take a selfie. Click. They touch heads. And we're seeing a lot more spread of these head lice now because the only way that you can get head lice is either touching the head of somebody else, and preferably head to head is the best way, or sharing combs and scarves. Do you share your comb with anybody else? You probably don't use a comb. Uh, <laughs> I don't use a comb either. Do you share your comb with anybody else? Of course not. You wouldn't. But I find girls will say, oh, that's a neat comb. Well, I'm going to try that. Let's see how that works out, or their brushes and, and so forth. So, again, we, we find transmission of head lice much more common among the girls than we do the guys in, in there. Do you have a question? What about, like, they say you can get like, and stuff like that? Uh, that would be possible. It's probably not very likely. Uh, in there, unless you've got somebody that's really slumped down and, and rubbing the back of their head back and forth in that. And the reason for that is, is that that seat is probably at a cooler temperature. And, and Now, why would they be in the comb and the brushes? Because you physically remove the lice by combing, and then when somebody else uh, uses that comb, they may actually comb that louse uh, into their hair uh, for that. The last one I want to talk about, and I apologize, I don't have really good pictures of this one <laughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, the crab louse is also called the pubic louse. How are you going to get crab lice? Well, the euphemism that we say is that you need close, intimate contact with somebody that's infested. Have sex with them, okay? You've got to rub your genitalia together, uh, at least your pubic areas, and, and it's really amazing. There's been studies on these. When it gets hot and moist, these lice just start moving around like mad. Right? You will not get them from the toilet seat. You're not going to get them from bedding. Okay? So it's... Uh, oh, <laughs> another not commonly known fact. These also are fairly common on beards and eyebrows. I'll let you figure out the social implications of that one. 